Thank you so much to everyone for being here this afternoon. I'm so excited to uh, present to you this session this afternoon on a focus on Black artists and their paths. I have three people to uh, present to you today as a panel to engage in some great conversations about, uh, about each of these people, uh, some of the great things that they're doing in the worlds of music and higher education and media and performance and, um, and all these other wonderful things, some of which you'll, you may be very familiar with, some of which you may learn a lot of new things about and how they have adapted some of what they do over time and even some of, uh, some of the things they've experienced specifically as Black artists in their respective fields and the impact of it. So I'm so excited to present this to all of you today. As you learn more about uh, the people that are talking to you today on this panel, I encourage you to, um, throughout this hour, think of uh, maybe some questions and things that you would like to inquire of the three of them about their experiences, about some of the differences in their different paths that you may learn about today. Some of you may be studying in the areas that they are going to talk about today of their careers and you may want to ask them about some things like that or some of the different uh, journeys that they have taken on those and even how some of them may have pivoted during this year and things of that sort. Um, the first thing I want to do as I introduce them to each of you, uh, and if you'll bear with me for just a moment, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to share my screen with you from my other device and share with you uh, just a brief one minute sam video sample um, of some YouTube links to show you a little bit about uh, what each of them do so that their work can start to speak for, uh, for a little bit of their experience as we get going, all right? So first up on our, our, uh, on our panel, I'm gonna, as I begin to share the screen, um, we have Dr. Dion Bennett. I've known her for uh, several years. She is currently a, uh, she has a, a wide, vast majority experience in vocal perf uh, performance and education. She's right now at the uh, at Ohio Christian University, where she's the uh, director of choral and vocal studies. She's also on the faculty at the Capitol Conservatory of Music, and previously served as the artistic director of Opera Project Columbus. And I'm so excited to have her with us today. She was. Uh, one of my former voice professors when I was an undergraduate student at Ashland University and just if they connected her over the years is such an exciting treat. So I'm going to start by sharing with you just a uh, brief one minute um, sample of her performing a few years ago. And I'll la later let her tell you a little bit about what you'll be hearing her sing. Hang on just a second. I apologize if any, uh, if we see any ads in some of these videos. Because my world is wide with laughter and my throat is deep with song. All right, thank you so much for that perf that sample. I hope you all enjoyed that. We're gonna come back right to her just momentarily. One of our 
And now uh, one of our other panelists, Mr. Jaron Legrere, who also has a, a fabulous experience throughout uh, um, a great variety in vocal music. He's a voice teacher and speech trainer as well. He's the founder and lead teacher of his own business of Jaron M. Legrere Studio. It's a private studio specializing specifically in voice training for speakers as well as singers. Um, and yet that studio is right here in the city of Akron. And he also serves on the voice faculty for institutions such as Youngstown University, Point Park University, and most recently, St. Mary's College of California, virtually, of course. So now, rather than just a straightforward singing performance, I'm going to share the one thing he started with his business during quarantine was analyzing vocal uh, and vocal performances and even um, speaking a little in a very, very careful analysis. So this is just one, a one minute sample of one of the first ones he did this year with the gospel singing artist group, uh, the Clark Sisters, back in April when their, uh, when their movie about that family first came out. In some and ways, part, part in the things end. are kind of the same. In other ways, well, they sound like. So I just want to, as you know, a voice teacher, compare and contrast the two recordings to kind of see what sounds we hear and things like that. I mean, they're both good recordings of the Clark cast and the Clark sisters. Like, they're both gonna be good recordings. So I am super excited to do this because I'm a huge fan and I'm excited about this movie. So let's dive in. <laughs> So I want to stop there. So two things are happening here. Number one, I want to talk about how they're shaping their vowels. So they said, ja, 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 ja. So they're rounding out the vowel to kind of finish the song in the aesthetic that Twinkie intended for it. Ja, with the little with the little trills in between ja well the sopranos with a little trills in between ja and while all those chords are changing in that motif right there you can hear them doing the little trills like that so that's number one number two i want to talk a little bit about all right there's just a little taste for you on that one it's Great to have Jaron here with us today. Great to be able to hear some, uh, have such a specific analysis on vocal technique for people that we listen to. Um, and I've known Jaron over the years. We went to high school together, so we're excited to have that uh, relationship of to have continued throughout several projects of ours over the years. Our third panelist, uh, Mr. Gabriel Black. <laughs> this is a bit of a pivot from uh, straight from strictly uh, music, but uh, Gabriel. Uh, is a videographer, a photographer, and an editor. Uh, he offers a variety of services and media throughout the Northeast Ohio area. And uh, over these last few years, he's directed and produced uh, a lot of different productions for different organizations, for churches, and for musicians uh, surrounding uh, places such as uh, Mount Calvary Church in Akron, the Chapel's main campus in downtown Akron, some projects for um, the, Nash, the Nelsonville Music Festival, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Kappa Alpha, and so many other places. Um, one of he's and he also, since uh, the audience here is uh, largely uh, music and choral, uh, he did a, a handful of different virtual choir performances where he edited and produced and came up with a layout for what a lot of those looked like. So I'm going to share with you just a moment of one of the first ones that uh, we worked on together this year uh, for the Youth Excellence Performing Arts workshop here in Akron to promote our virtual program. And this is uh, using the backdrop of, of a song from Kanye West's Sunday um, service choir called Back to Life. Steady, are you ready? What's going on? What's going on?
And if you guys experience a, a, a slight glitch in the um, audio and video connection, just know that that's the fault of, of Zoom, not of, of, his, uh, of his production. But yeah, very excited to have all of you here today. Gabriel, I'm especially excited uh, for Gabriel, of course, Whoa. because he's my brother. So they're both, both uh, Rachel and I's uh, siblings. So thank you all so much for being here. I'd like to um, open to let each of them introduce themselves, who they are and what they do and things like that. So we'll start uh, first with Gabriel and then we'll go to Jaron and then we'll go to Dr. Bennett. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel. Um, I, like you said, I am his brother. Um, I, yeah, I'm a, uh, I just do a plethora of media work and right now I'm a media specialist here at um, Mount Calvary Baptist Church as well as a minority behavior health group um, and a couple other entities that are uh, connected to the church as well. Um, real easy going dude, you know, just, just like making really nice looking things, really nice looking art pieces. That's all. Also, hey, Jerry. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess I'll go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. So, um, so hi, everybody. I'm Jan LeGreer. Um, like Brian said, I've known um, Brian and his family for a long time. Gabriel did some video work for my studio to add that in there. So Gabe does some awesome, awesome work. Um, but I'm a voice teacher and speech coach, speech trainer, I'm sorry, from the great city of Akron, Ohio. I'm a singer by trade. I grew up singing in church, everything like that. Um, and so I kind of, my, my goal was to always just help people like me sing better, you know, so and use your voices more efficiently. So that's kind of where a very broad, a very broad umbrella of what I, why I do what I do. Um, but yeah, I have you know, which, um, University of Akron. I went to Ohio State, go Bucks for my uh, masters. Um, and so, so yeah, kind of like teach all university and things like that. But you know, my goal is to always just you know help people be their best self vocally, no matter what genre, what they're trying to do. So, so yeah, I'm excited to be a part. I guess it's my turn. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, Dr. Dion Parker Bennett. I am uh, originally from Akron, Ohio, as well. Um, I went to University of Akron uh, for my bachelor's and my master's. I went to the University of Illinois for my doctorate. Um, I started out Gospel Church um, at Zion Apostolic on the corner of Howard and Talmadge in Akron and uh, somehow ended up in this classical field right now. I am the director of choral and vocal studies here um, at the Ohio Christian University. Um, and then I also teach um, uh, part-time at Capitol Conservatory of Music. Um, I love teaching. I found my love of teaching in college um, in my master's program. And, I, uh, and since then, I've all I've done is music. So either I've been teaching or now I'm choral conducting. So that's what I love to do. And you do it well, and I'll, as, as do all three of you. <laughs> yeah, um, so the first thing I'd like to have each of you talk a little bit about um, is something that I've spoken to each of you about on um, uh, at different times in different stages is um, we, 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 with one of our previous guests in another virtual session with one of our, with a couple of our graduate accompanists a couple weeks ago, we talked about how there's sometimes a, when, when you're in college and when you're studying your field, there's oftentimes like the ideal trajectory or career path, you know, or sometimes, especially like we feel there's like a little bit of a, a box, so to speak, of the training and the expectations uh, that like, for example, you're as a career uh, classical musician, like these are the works that you study. This is the kind of job you're going to have. Um, this is what your mentors and teachers are going to do. And, but then things will change and adapt frequently, whether it's a major change or, or other opportunities. So um, can you just talk a little bit about uh, what were your original career plan goals when you were in college, when you were um, like many of the people watching us today, when you were 18, 19, 20 years old, um, what, what was your kind of original career plan at that time? And then what did you have to do to kind of pivot or to adjust 
um, into what you do now, as far as like what some of those changes were. And I want to start. Um, I want to start with Gabriel uh, first. You were uh, most recently studying at o at um, Ohio University and kind of found your way into um, the things that you do now, and that's kind of adapted over the last few years from some college opportunities and different things, mostly in the community. Um, so can you kind of talk to um, what you were originally kind of thinking, what you thought you'd be doing, and how you've kind of adapted and changed into what you do now? Um, well, I, I did just finish up at Ohio University, but I actually started at Ashland University. And honestly, I was the, I was the quintessential, I have no clue what I'm going to do, uh, student. Like, I just... I first went in, I, uh, I just started studying to be a radio producer and then a radio personality. And then um, I transferred and then I got into films and I wanted to be a TV, uh, television producer and then a photographer and then an entrepreneur. I was all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, uh, I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I was just swaying in all different types of lanes. Um, but I didn't know you know, it was like those things, I needed to know all of that for what I do now. Um, but the the original career path was all of those things. <laughs> and it just, it just changed, I don't know, like every year of like, I'm going to do this. Nah, I'm going a, I'm, I'm a to be a full-time photographer. Nah, I'm going to be a full-time videographer entrepreneur. I'm going to have my own. And then every so often it just shifted. Yeah, things just kind of continued uh, re-shifting, re-pivoting, and kind of, some of that probably kind of came from where you really started to find your sweet spot and your uh, what you really, really enjoy uh, doing and things like that. Yeah, what are like some of the like things you mostly like? I know you really, really enjoy like editing, particularly mm -hmm. like what like what really got you into editing production specifically. So. I, it was one of those things that, uh, as a nature of the trade of what we, of what I do, um, it, w it just fell into my lap of like, hey, make videos, you gotta edit them. Um, and I just enjoy being behind a computer somehow way more than actually being on, I, I like, I love being on a shoot, but just sitting back and editing that, um, or just getting a Dropbox foot, uh, folder full of just footage and it's like, hey, edit that. And it's like, okay. Um, it's so, I don't know what it is, just that um, tedious work. I feel like you can really have your hand on a project even more in post than even on the shoot. So um, I think over time, just um, I started editing um, um, newsreels and, um, in college and started editing um, talking head performances and things like that, um, and, or talking head, yeah, just uh, speakers. And then over over a short amount of time, I just really figured out that not only was I good at it, but I really liked it. Yeah, and, and even in that, like you've got already um, over the last three years, like gotten, it's put you in position to make connection with a lot of different people over the, um, around the city, beyond, uh, even around and beyond Northeast Ohio, between people at different churches, at different, um, uh, even a mental health organization, um, with Maisha McIntyre, I believe, and uh, with some different schools and institutions, um, a couple of things that we've done at uh, Kent State. Jared mentioned uh, even things for his website and things like that. And, you know, I'm sure that those weren't necessarily things you um, necessarily expected, you know, during uh, even when transitioning between those two schools. No, it, it, it really was. Um, it, it felt like things just falling in my lap. Um, not knowing that this is what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, it, it, I hate to use the word like it found me, but it was, I, I just loved it. And I surrounded myself with people who, um, if not was in my field, also was in an artistic field that liked to do things at a high standard of excellence. So when people wanted to have, um, when people wanted to have, oh, can you do a, a, a concert? something like a concert set or, or, or um, a music video, um, just things, hey, can you record this? Hey, can you take pictures for my headshots? Okay, let me figure it out. I will figure out how to do it and I will get it done. That's right. Just being in the right place at the right time and then figuring it out as it happens and learning through it. 
Yes. And like you said, keeping a high standard of excellence throughout all of that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I want to go over to Jaren with the same uh, question. I mean, we've talked a lot over about how your path has changed. Like, I know you had a lot of major changes in undergrad as soon as you started. And even though you had a musical background prior to college, like I know there was a little bit of a uh, fight or a battle to really start to embrace that and then to find new ways versus just um, wanting to go as indirect of a pathway of vocal uh, teaching and performing and things like that. So I, uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for you to kind of speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so um, so long story short, you know, I went to school, Miller South Firestone at all the performing arts schools in Akron um, for vocal, did all, all the choirs, everything you could think of. I would make this with everything, okay? And so um, so after grad, after um, high school, went to um, Akron, University of Akron, I'm sorry. And um, I didn't want to do music because I thought I knew everything at that point. I was like, oh, I, I, I got it. I've been singing for 18 years at this point. Why would I need to go back again? Like, come on. So I tried, I did graphic design for like 24 hours. It didn't really work out. Then I did like psychology for like two hours. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I took um, a year and a half of gen ed studies because I was trying to fight the whole music bug. I'm like, no, I want to find something because at, the, at that point I said, I can't have a career in music because it's not secure. I said that. I thought that, you know. So I got to find something else to fall back on. You know, my mom kept saying, Jaren, you need to go for music. I'm like, mom, no, you know, and you know, I was blessed to have parents who supported the art, the arts with all three of them. I have two older brothers. We all sing. My parents supported all three of us hard, you know, very much so in the arts. And so, but I fought it. And my parents said, boy, if you don't stop playing, but I'm like, no, mom, I don't want to go. And so after my third semester in, I finally on a whim signed up for the auditions at Akron U and got in and started studying music there. And it was during my undergrad time that I knew I wanted to be a professor and like a voice teacher. I didn't know until I got to music and probably, probably to my last couple of years, maybe last year and a half there. Um, and it was a simple thought process. I said, wow, they teach people this stuff for a living. I want to do that. That's really kind of how it wasn't anything deep, wasn't anything profound. Literally, that's how one day I was sitting in the hallway and it came to me and I said, okay. So I knew then I was like, I had to get a master's at some point, at least, you know. And so, so at, that was that point. But I remember even in high school, my voice teacher at the time, he wanted me to try for Juilliard so bad, so bad. And I told him, I said, I, res I, I respect and I appreciate your love for my voice and how you think of it. Thank you so much. So I said, but it's just not what I want to do, you know? And he reluctantly understood, you know? So even in, grad in, in undergrad, when I had my teachers and they heard me singing, they were like, you should do this. And they had all these plans for me. Um, and I'm just like, that's not what I really want to do. I want to teach. I don't really want to perform. Um, I really like to teach a lot more than, I mean, I still like to perform, but you know, teaching is just kind of where my heart is. And so, um, so I did that. And so I got my undergrad, um, a BA in music. And then I took, I would say two years off and kind of taught at a few, you know, um, private institutions in Akron. Um, and then I ended up going to, it was, I was shooting to a bell. Vermont and um, Ohio State for grad school. She was Ohio State. Um, and it was during that time that I really got my teaching chops because my master's in pedagogy, not so much performance, it's actually master's in voice pedagogy. So I really got my teaching chops, you know, formally there. But it was there that I realized I didn't want to always teach classical because this wasn't my wheelhouse. You know, I, I can sing it, but it, my heart wasn't in it. And I'm just being honest, you know, but I knew that I wanted to teach. And I said, wow. I know so many people who sing in church with me or who sing musical theater or whatever else, they have voices too. They need help too. And I'm like, what if I went there? And so I remember having that thought even starting grad school and I was met with opposition. I was. And so I'm trying to make a long story short. So I still pro uh, progressed on through it because I'm one of those hard headed people who kind of just said, I'm just gonna go for what I want to do. And I don't care what people have to say. I've always been that way. I've always been, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, some people are like, you know, my trajectory changed. Mm -mm. I had the same thought from day one. I just blocked other people out. So I was a little bit of a, of a hard head in that, or stubborn in that regard, but I just call it determined. But anyway, so, um, so I got my master's and I knew I wanted to teach a different way. So I started my own studio while my master's program. I was teaching voice lessons privately. I mean, I got like 
I would people would pay me at McDonald's when I first started. Like it was so simple, you know. But hey, I started somewhere. So and Brian was one of my first clients. Oh my gosh, way, 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 way back then, before I even started the studio. So anyway, I started the studio and I really wanted to teach um, you know, gospel. R&B, hip hop, that kind of stuff, because those people use their voices too. Even teachers, rappers, actors, preachers, people like that. So that's kind of how my studio formed in a nutshell, in a big nutshell. Um, and you know, it's, and it's interesting that I was made with opposition when I, when I wanted to start my own studio. People said, you know, I remember one day we were in class and they were like, you know, who wants to have their own private studio? I was the only one in my whole cohort who raised my hand. Everybody else had their hands down. Um, everybody else said, you know, who wants to do college? I raised my hand for that one too. Everybody raised their hand for that one. But, you know, I was the only one who raised my hand for the private studio. And it was so interesting because I'm like, nobody wants to have their own. I want to have my own thing, you know. So and I knew I wanted to play by a different set of rules, you know, in terms of the teaching thing. And we'll get more into that later. But, but yeah, so that's kind of how my trajectory changed. I kind of, not changed, but just kind of, I just was focused on, I want to teach those people. You know, but there's not a lot of research for that genre, for this genre, for those genres, you know, so I'm going to get more in depth in that type of stuff and may and be a, a solution to a problem. So that's kind of how my teaching kind of got started. So, Yeah, and in that being able to really capitalize and focus on um, and on oh, really broadening and opening up who your audience is and who uh, whose voices you're serving and things like that uh, from your own experiences of, of not, you know, always feeling as seen or heard. Uh, and yeah. not keeping it like as focused and streamlined and things like that, but just in a, in a different, but still very positive and beneficial way. Yes, absolutely. And not, and, 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 and being okay with going a different path. Cause I think some people, some people just don't, aren't okay with it. They don't have enough confidence in it. You know, they get met with opposition. So they turn it off. You know, um, I wanted to turn it off several times, but I knew there was something I had to do in this field that was not typical. You know, pe yeah, people was like, you know, you doing, you're doing so much now. And I'm like, listen, I have to fight to get where I am now. And I'm still fighting, you know? So, so, you know, so, so yeah, I really wanted to make, bring a positive light, like you said, to these genres and these voices who otherwise was never heard in a much positive way from, for many people, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's incredible. I, and that, that sort of pivots into my next uh, um, speaking point, but I wanna turn over to Dr. Bennett to just talk a little about your experiences, how things have pivoted. I mean, you, um, to me, one of the most fascinating things is your um, experience within, um, within studying vocal, uh, studying vocal music and teaching um, teaching at the collegiate level and uh, performing in nationally, internationally in several operas and uh, recitals and oratorios and things, and then pivoting into uh, choral music over these last few years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you had talked about the original plan. I had no original plan. So there was, I came from a gospel church, like I said, and so my father um, I wanted to take a gap year after high, after high school. My father said no. So he took me on the last day of registration to the University of Akron. And he, he made me sign up for uh, typing, shorthand. Y'all probably don't even know anything about shorthand. Typing, shorthand, geography, and um, English. And I think I might have taken a music theory class. But in my last year of high school, that was the first time I had ever done choir. I knew I was a musical person, but that's the only time I'd ever done an actual uh, classical school kind of choir. And so my teacher took me to OMEA that year. And he said, you know, if you, when you get to college, you may want to take one, a voice lesson or a couple of voice lessons. So when I got to college, my undergrad, um, my first that semester with the typing and the shorthand, and I started playing piano for the church. I started traveling. I wasn't doing any homework. Plus, who does shorthand? You know what I'm saying? So um, I messed up that first semester. And so I ended up on probation the first semester. So I needed an easy A class. That little voice said, take a voice lesson. I took voice lessons so I could get an easy A. From there, I got with a full-time teacher. And out the second semester, I said, okay, I want another easy A. So I signed up for the next number. So I was in 180. I signed up for 181. They said, now you're a voice major. 
I said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I don't even know what that is. I, doesn't sound secure to me. I don't see any money in that. And so she said, well, why don't you be a voice major now and just see what it looks like? And that's how I became a voice major. So I, I didn't really understand all of it. I just kept doing the songs that she told me to sing and she would send me away and I would come back with a scholarship. I would come back with some sort of check. I, and I was kind of like, okay. I also got a solo in my concert choir, which, and the, the choir was singing Porgy and Bess at that point. And she gave, she, I, this is the first time I'd ever heard of summertime in my life. I didn't know anything about Porgy and Bess. She taught, she showed me how to do it. She pulled out all the most beautiful music she could find and she gave it to me and showed me how to sing it. It wasn't a whole lot of technique stuff. It was, this is how you sing it. And I mimicked her the whole time. And I, I sang that and that was the first time my parents, my family ever knew that I could sing like this. Now, I don't know why God didn't let me just stay at the gospel church, but I was an awful gospel. I was an awful gospel singer. Um, and so then, but I worked with the choir, so I knew I was musical. So I worked with the choir and I could, I could direct the gospel choir. I just couldn't sing any of it. I did the classical vocal study. I got my master's and I'm still directing the choir at the church. You know, you just, you know, you get with the, the rhythm of, and you, you know, swing your arms. I'm, I'm straight. But when I got married, that was it. My husband had trained to be a choral director. So there was no sense of me perpetrating. So I did not do it any longer. So I'm married. Now I've, now I've delved into getting a doctorate. That was all by accident too. So uh, I get the, I, I'm studying to get the doctorate. I've put away all the choral anything. I, haven't, I don't do anything choral. I only sing. Um, I only sing classical, and even in high in college, I got to go to Graz. Um, I sang there. You know, I started doing operas and all of that. I get to um, Ohio Christian. All I came here to do, they asked, they needed a soprano soloist. I came to sing Messiah for them. Came in December, sang Messiah, and it was my first real Messiah. I. And, and, and apparently it went pretty well because before the end of the night, the director, Rodney Soames, asked me, would you come back next year? I said, sure. By May, or by, th that was, yeah, that was December. By May, the department chair had asked me, would you come and do a recital and a masterclass? Well, by this time I knew I loved teaching and I could do the classical stuff. I, I understood it now. I said, okay, fine. That was May. By August, he said, would you come and do some adjunct teaching for us? Sure, because I can do the teaching. I understand that part now. I understand that part of me. Okay, fine. But the caveat was you have to teach, uh, you have to teach the chamber singers. That was a small group about six singers, and I was supposed to teach them classical repertoire because this is a Christian school. A lot of their music was worship. And so I was to teach them classical music that they could take out to the public schools if they ever got jobs in the public schools. I'm like, but I'm not a choral. I don't, I don't really, well, that's the job. Okay, fine. I'll do that. At the same time, I got part-time at Capitol Conservatory. So I'm doing these two adjunct jobs. I'm living my best life. And I'm having fun doing this chamber singer group. And I would go back to like songs that I did in undergrad and I would teach them these songs. Two years of that, there were some personnel changes. They asked me in May after two years, they said, would you help the choir, our, our directors, leaving, would you help the choir get ready for Festival of Carols and they're doing the Messiah? Oh yeah, because I knew I can work, I can work those sopranos on their part. Yeah, sure. So they call me in for a meeting. I go in for this meeting. I thought we're just going to talk numbers, how we're going to change my part-time, my adjunct position into, you know, adding some more to it because I'm going to be helping the choir. 
no, that was not the, the, the conversation. The conversation was, we have created a position for you to actually teach the choral. That's the main uh, choir here. And I'm like, what? Because everything else I was saying yes to. I was like, I, I, I don't do that. My husband does that, but I don't, no, we want you to do this. And that's what I have been doing for the past five years. So I jumped into OCDA, any, any choral, anything I could jump into. I jumped into it because now I need to get an education in choral conducting. I had only taken one choral conducting class in my life. So now I need to figure it out. And they're only on, they're on one year contracts. So you have to be asked back the next year. And then you have to be asked back the year after. They keep asking me back. And so here I am. And what's uh, part of what's so fascinating to me about that for you, really for all three of you to a degree, is that um, despite a lot of differences in what you originally began to do, a lot of your own work and talent made room for you into these other positions, into these uh, places where you could really, really be used to capitalize on skills, even things that you didn't realize uh, that you had. Um, and that slightly kind of takes me to our next point. I wish I, I would... Uh, I wish we had twice the amount of time to go into this is <laughs> then we uh, then we do unfortunately but somehow we'll have to find a way to talk about this in the minutes that we have remaining um, I would I'd love to um, have you speak have you guys speak a little bit to um, the, the reality is that as black artists in our field there's going to be differences that are uh, that are just very different from our white counterparts in uh, between opportunities and uh, how many things work. So can you, if you guys could please, uh, I would we'll have to do a kind of very short, um, but if you guys could talk to how your, the trajectory of your career from the traditional expectations, how those things were different because you are a black person in your field and maybe how you had to find success in spite of that. And I'll start with whichever one of you would like to open up about that first. Okay, I'll go, I'll go real quick. I'm trying to be really quick on time, so I'll go. Um, and I'll make this another long story short. But um, <clears throat> in my grad school time, time of grad school, I went to a workshop called Estel Voice Training. And that's that that workshop changed my entire trajectory. That changed my trajectory of unexpectedly of my whole career. I attended this workshop blindly. Um, somebody at grad school was like, you should go to this and try it. I'm like, girl, I don't know what this is. I went, I loved it. Um, I went back a second time. I got certified in this stuff. Um, and the, the director of Esther Voice, for some reason, found a liking to me. I sang for a workshop. I sung, I think I sung How Beautiful, How Beautiful Are the Feet of Them. I was studying as a male soprano back then. And I did How Beautiful Are the Feet from Handel's Messiah. And we did it. And she loved it. She, we came in contact. I was going to get my doctorate at Shenandoah University. I applied, auditioned, got in, but I got no money. And so I said, okay. Um, and I realized money was given out to other people who did look like me. And so I was the only one who was black in my, in that cohort. And I did not get any money and that broke my heart. I was so embarrassed. I mean, I'll make it a big deal. I'll be Dr. LeGrand for three years. I made such a big deal about it. It was such a goal of mine to be a doctor before I was 30. That was my goal. And so I was so embarrassed. So ended up not going. Six days after I told her I didn't go, the lady from Estel, she called me and she said, hey, do you need a job? And I was like, yeah, you know, and she was like, um, Point Park is hiring. Do you want to um, audition? Or, I'm such a uh, singer. Oh, you want to interview? And I was like, what's Point Park? I didn't know it was a college. I had no idea. And I want to be a college professor. I had no idea it was a college. So she said, it's a college here in Pittsburgh. Come to find out, one of the top 20 musical theater schools in the nation. Didn't know that at the time either. And so I went to audition blindly, didn't know what this place was. And I went, interviewed 40 minutes into my drive back home from Pittsburgh. I'm on 76 um, West. And they called me, hey, you got the job, you start Monday. That was a Thursday. And so that changed everything that day. I remember crying in the car, like, oh my gosh, 
I quit my doctor program and four days later I got a job. Like, you know, like I was so nervous and so scared. Like, what am I going to do? And I remember sitting on my computer and my parents were ripping from my computer. Like, you need to go eat and watch TV. You need to relax. Like, you need to, you know. And so it was then that I knew that was my trajectory. Musical theater, which I didn't know, you know, musical theater and all that kind of stuff. But even in that, it helped me understand the voice in very different lights. Um, and so I was able to teach my clients who sung in church, who did all this other stuff, who otherwise were not getting the, the, the research and the, and the uh, attention needed for their voices. And so I felt like that was a big part of my plight is to help those singers. Nothing against any other singer on this planet, any other speaker on this planet, but I know those singers were underserviced. And I felt like it was my duty as a person who came from that background, who studied, you know, formerly at colleges, but who still sung that stuff currently to still do it. I remember being in grad school and I was in a choir, Ricky Dillard and New Generation Chorale, Grammy Award winning choir of Chicago, my favorite cars in the world. I was with him for seven years singing alto and we sing hard gospel, hard gospel, vibrato, belting, cry, coy, till, all that stuff. I remember being met with opposition even then. My teachers hated the fact that I sung gospel that frequently because I would go sing Sunday night in Indiana or go to Detroit, you know, Karen Clark's church and sing, you know, with them the Monday morning voice lesson at 10 a.m. They didn't like that. You're going to damage your voice. This, that, and the third. I've never had a problem in undergrad or grad with my voice doing that stuff. I would just thank God I was able to do both. But to me, it was at, at one point I said, why is what I, the way I learned to sing, why is what I learned to sing now bad for my voice? 18 years of my life, I sung gospel, never had a problem. But now, it's a problem because, you know, I'm in grad school studying classical. Why is that a problem? You know, so it was those moments like that, that I'll say as a, as a black singer in academia, they expect me to stop what is culturally sound to me to, 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 uh, to be in the box that some people want to put me in or kind of have me in the thought process some people want to put me in. So it was those moments that I knew I had to be that person, that teacher in there to help other students behind me um, understand that every genre is okay. Like, you're not gonna hurt your voice singing gospel. You're not gonna hurt your voice singing Billie Eilish. You're not gonna hurt your voice, you know. And it's just as great as Handel Messiah, as Felix Mendelssohn, as all these other artists and composers who I love, you know. So, so that was kind of, that, those moments right there kind of told me, and even in the recent time, I'm trying to make this really quick, and even in the recent times that have been going on this year, um, with everything, you know, since the pandemic started to have, everything kind of came to light. Um, I have been having to have conversations with different teachers and different professionals in that light you know and I'm glad I'm at a platform to where they listen a little bit more now than they used to because when I was talking about this a couple years ago they was not listening you know but now they're, they're seeking out for me to talk about this stuff but it's still such an uphill battle to face as a black artist in America no matter what you do no matter what art your your medium is as a black artist in America it's hard it's just different it's not the same experience as our other counterparts um but even so, you know, we use that, 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 uh, that, you know, energy as strength to press on and to still, you know, do we have to do to help those behind us? So. Right, right, exactly. Let's maybe go to just very quickly, let's go to Gabriel and then we can go to Dr. Bennett to kind of close up some thoughts here. Um, so mine was kind of twofold uh, when looking at this. So I'll never forget um, when I was, when I transferred to OU, a couple, which is uh, vastly more diverse than National University. Um, but I, I'll never forget going into some of my major classes, especially the ones I was excited about, um, teaching about post-production, teaching about editing, um, and teaching about like the concepts of what we're making and things like that. Um, going into some of those classes, being the only Black student in there being the only black kid in there. And I was so nervous about like, should I be in here? Am I supposed to be here? And we were doing like a found footage project. Um, you, you just take, I guess, whatever. And it was supposed to be like, take a bunch of music videos that you're inspired from, take it down and melt it into like one good storyline. We did that. And so I'm taking a bunch of music videos that I love from back in the day. Um, some, some from Wale, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, Rihanna, you know, like whatever I could find, stuff that I like. And I'll never forget, like it came down and like everybody in the class was just, okay, nice, that was great. 
people. And it was just, it was weird. It was super weird. And then I'm watching everybody else's. And it was like, it was a whole bunch of artists I've never heard of. It was a whole lot of, um, and then like the one, I don't know, it was, it was a weird experience to the point that I was wondering if I was in the right field. Um, I noticed, especially in, um, in media, you do have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of black artists in, in media normally go the entrepreneur route, or if they do things like film and television, they are either directors, or if they do media in general, they're producers, music producers, um, make beats or make um, music, all of that. But not a whole lot of people are editors or producers, uh, TV producers or film producers. And so I was sitting there wondering, and then wondering, you know, at that time, that was also like around the time of like, um, Oscar so wide and um, like all those other things like disparity and like the Academy and all that. Um, and I was wondering, am I like, am I supposed to be here? Is this like not a black field or something? Um, and actually the ironic thing is I saw a tweet that Jaren put out and he, and it was a tweet that was like, if you're in the room, you're supposed to be, I'm paraphrasing. That's what I took from it. I'm supposed to be, <laughs> I'm supposed to be here. Um, and so if, and so if you're in, if you're in a, if you're in a space and you're, and you might feel like you're the only, you're the only face that looks like yours. If you're in the room, you're supposed to be in the room. And that's something I had to take to heart. And that's something I had to walk in confidence everywhere else. The other half was I just got done doing an internship um, at the main campus of the chapel. And so again, in my field, I, um, people, there's a whole lot of conversation and uh, debate about does the hardware and the, does the technology itself make it look better? Or is it the person behind the camera? Which one is it? And to be fair, it's a marriage of them. It's a mixture. You have to have an eye to do it because you give somebody random, um, if you give somebody a, a beginner um, a really nice camera, you're going to get like average looking thing. But then uh, all through everything that I was learning, I felt like I was at a good place. People were saying, oh, you do good work, you do good work. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I just feel like I'm lacking on the technology side. I don't have enough money to put it up to get there. I don't have a whole lot of things. And then, um, especially looking at, um, if we're looking at churches and going from um, black churches to a predominantly white church and the, the, um, the resources that they had was unfathomable at a, to, to, for a second. And was like, oh, okay. Not only is it not only is it the resources, um, the technology of it, but the resources that you guys have um, personally, the networking that you guys do. Not knowing that, oh, it's this person I need to talk to, and understanding the tight community, which I'm not a, I'm. There's nothing wrong with that. Having a tight community so that um, knowing somebody who whoever is um, of influence or what or whatnot. Um, can uh, mandate like a job or opportunity or something like that. That's cool. What I had to then learn on the networking side is um, networking in my community and making sure that one, my community is taken care of on the media side and then knowing, hey, now I know what you guys need. You need this, this, and this. You need this camera, this camera, this camera. And we, and now I need to go find the higher up in my community and say, hey, we need to pull more um, beginning entrepreneurs, beginning uh, videographers, beginning photographers up um, and get them in a good, stable place. So those are the two things that I always think about um, being, uh, being Black in my field. Yeah, and it just really goes to show like how, um, kind of like you said, like adding the, despite those, still the intention, it really secretes that uh, intention of even despite who you are and where you come from, what you look like, that you're still supposed to be there for a reason, no matter what. Like, like I mean, the like you said, if you're in the room, you're supposed to be there, and there's supposed to be things that the you know that your counterparts will see and learn and understand from that, you know, no no matter what that looks like. You know, I know we're uh, we're a couple minutes over time here. You know, I if. Uh, as we wrap up here, if, the, if everyone who's on this call is able to stick around for these, last, for these final parting thoughts, I highly encourage you to uh, do so. I want to um, give Dr. Bennett a chance to um, 
uh, speak to, to this herself before we come to a close here? Um, so being a Black artist in my field, I had to first figure out who, who I am. What is my vision of who I am? Um, and, and for a long time, I, I did not know. I had no clue um, who I was um, because I would look at my majority counterparts and they were skinny and they had the long blonde hair or the, the really thick hair. And in the opera field, you know, it's, it's almost like television. You got to look like something. And um, coming, to, coming to grips with God made me enough. God made me who I am. He made me, he made my looks exactly for what my purpose was. He made my body type for exactly what my purpose was. And, um, and then he started, like, I started getting put into different places that I didn't know Black folks went. So the first thing was, uh, when I was, I was graduating from University of Akron, I got a scholarship to go to Graz, Austria. And my parents, I, when I went home and told them, I said, so I'm gonna go to Graz, Austria to study. We're gonna be gone for like six to eight weeks or whatever. My mom, my mom and dad were like, no, no, we don't do that. We as black folks don't, don't we don't do that. Why, why are you doing something like that? And I said, but I feel like I'm supposed to be there. And they were like, well, whatever. And so I literally had to go and raise money to to be able to do this at the same time i had two very dear friends of mine we were going to do uh, a a recital so that we could all raise money together because we were going because i was terrified i had never i i've been out of ohio but shucks overseas that was that was a new thing and so one of them at, at a, a certain point you know the recital part wasn't happening for the three of us and so my, my counterpart, one of my friends, her father just wrote her a check for $5,000 to go. Well, my parents had already told me, oh, we don't do this. So I had to put my two feet together and beat the pavement and, and ask for money and just kept asking, kept asking. Thank God I went. Um, but God was... Uh, and I'm, I'm a woman of faith, so if I, you know, I'm, I'm going to say God helped me and God blessed me to do that. So I got to go to Graz, Austria. But when I got to Graz, Austria, I felt like I had to sing for my life and I had to sing for the folks that helped me get there. Um, being Black also, they will always tell me, you know, you sing poor again best, you're going to get pigeonholed and that's going to be it. That's all you're going to be able to do. And so for the longest time, I tried to stay away from it. However, that opened up doors for me to sing in that. Um, but then, you know, people ask you to sing for it and then they, they don't wanna ask you to sing for anything else. Um, I have been blessed though. I've been able to sing the Foray Requiem. I've been able to sing Messiah. I've been able to sing Bohem. I've been able to, so I, I, was, I was able to do that. Now, what does that have to do with this choral thing? Well, when I go to teach now, and I teach choral and I teach vocal, I teach my students, you don't know where you're going to end up. So therefore, you need to pay attention because everything connects. Everything connects. Remember, I, I was directing the gospel choir as a teenager, and now here I am, a professor doing choral. I was singing in the gospel choir and now I'm a classical singer. I've sung all over and now I'm teaching other people to sing. So my vision of myself has evolved and, and kind of changed and it keeps changing and it keeps evolving. The other week I was asked to speak um, at, for chapel. Okay, my father is a pastor. My brother is a pastor. My mother is a preacher. I am not any of that. They all got that. At, at least that's what I thought. Until now, I'm speaking. So being Black as a Black artist, I have always been in a majority-run institution. I'm usually the only African-American 
um, up until three weeks before this semester started, I was the only black faculty member on this campus, the only one, and had been, had been for five years. And even before me, I don't know who had been. So I'm the only full, I was the only full-time black faculty member, but now we're in this time and period. Guess who they come to when they have questions? Get, and and, and it, it's not just because I'm black, but I've been black with excellence. I've been black with grace. I've been black with beauty. I've been, so in all of that, um, when you're black in in a field you have to be with excellence you have to walk with excellence you have to talk with excellence my whole life it seems i have been trained for that whether i knew it or not i knew how to speak i knew how to walk i knew how to dress i knew how to talk i knew how to do my hair i knew how to do all of those things and that all is part of it so when so that when you arrive you actually arrive. When you come to the table, you come straight. You come, you know, you, you not half step in anything. So that's, that's all I got. Thank you so much. It's, I mean, it's beyond amazing, incredible. All, all three of you, like it's, it's so wonderful and inviting to just remember like the exact things that you guys have stated that um, just how, how much, um, even though we're in fields as black people um, where we may feel uh, there may be some discomfort and some uh, things that are unsettling because we're literally the minority. Sometimes like the off, o often the only one in the room or in the conversation uh, and things like that, you know, we are still, you know, so we, there is that added expectation on ourselves to be excellent, to be the best as often as possible, just so that we have an opportunity strictly just to be seen right. in places where we don't always have, you know, as much accessibility, just so we can get the visibility and get the opportunities um, to go on from there. But the stronger, I'm really, um, uh, I continue like really open prayer that kind of stuff really, uh, as far as visibility really goes um, in, in these different fields that, that we're all in. Um, that that stronger visibility for all of us makes for greater opportunity and increased interest mm -hmm. for you know our students and our um, and our kids and people who are continue our next generations uh, who will continue and it's so humbling to, to just remember um, and to talk about these things just um, just as an encouragement that you know that like Dr. Benick said we are. Um, you know, we were excellent on purpose. We were raised and trained into this stuff so that, you know, like Gabriel said, once we get in that room, it's not like an accident. It's not because we don't look a certain way. Like it's, we're, like we're supposed to be there, period, and make, still make a strong difference. So I know I have some um, other black faculty and students that are, on, um, that are on this call today too. Like I hope that that's something that you can stay encouraged uh, into, that whether it's in, one of these performing arts or any other field, you know, where you may feel um, like you're literally the only one there or uncomfortable for that reason, or other people may be uncomfortable because, uh, because you're there, just not know some of the cultural norms around you. Do you anyway, be, do what you have, be what you have, like you're, you're there for a reason, like don't, don't feel like you have to succumb to a box, like take the tools that you're learning in that program, in that classroom, um, and that internship, whatever it is, and make and make that work and i hope to everyone else on this call today too that this is a good informants in education for you some of you are um i know are education majors or will be in place where you do work with other people who are very different from you for a lot of reasons um so take that to heart take that to you know um to just kind of in welcome the change and welcome and embrace people who come from uh who come from different backgrounds so you can learn collectively to work with them and uh and and learn uh from them as, as best as you can. Yeah, I wish we had like another like three hours to really go into um, all of this, but I'm so thankful to our panelists, uh, to all three of you, to Dr. Bennett and to Mr. LeGrand and to Mr. Black, for all three of you for joining us here today. Thank you so much for your willingness 
to share your experiences with us this afternoon. I so appreciate it. Um, and thank you too to, um, um, we have a wonderful diversity and equity and inclusion task force that's um, emerged this semester in the School of Music. And I know our coordinators, um, Dr. Tiffy and uh, Ms. Fowler are here with us too. Thank you guys to, um, for the uh, opportunity to share this throughout the School of Music as well. Um, to all of our students, hope that you're able to take some great things away from this and to keep these conversations going and to keep your eyes peeled and open uh, for these things, all right? We will uh, go ahead and, and, and wrap up our session there. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, the, I encourage you guys, I know the um, info on this session, uh, you can see some of the website links for Gabriel and for Jaren, and I can throw those things in uh, some of their emails if you'd like to continue following their careers and the different things that they do. Uh, Jaren Studio has some great products. I'm wearing one of the uh, t-shirts uh, right now from, from his studio. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful, safe and healthy weekend. Take care. Take care. Take care, y'all. Bye. Thank you for facil facilitating this, Brian. Yes. Great job. Give it yes. up for Brian. Oh, my gosh. Awesome. <laughs> All right, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Brian, I loved it. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for always answering the call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kay. <laughs>